Um, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to all the regular members and newly baptized members and welcome to everyone on Zoom and welcome to the visitors. It's so lovely to see you. Um, it's a great privilege to be in the house of the Lord on the correct day. It's special because God's holy day, right? It's not about us. Um, there's so much happening in this world today. I don't know if you remember back in 2008, um, great financial crisis. It, it was a global financial crisis. I don't know if you guys remember. Um, I had a very difficult time back then with um, mentally difficult time because of all the things that were happening at, the, at that time. Um, but I want to um, draw attention to what's happening in the world today, right now, like war in Ukraine and um, just rumors of wars everywhere in the Middle East, uh, where I came from, like South Korea for now, example now, they're talking about regime change in North Korea. That's actually exciting development if you really think about it, because the gospel of the kingdom has to what? Go around, preach to all the world to be a witness before the end comes. So if North Korea opens, you know, what's going to happen, you know? That's exciting, it's exciting development. But for many people in this world, um, these final events would happen really rapidly, and it's going to catch them with a very big surprise. I'm just praying that we, as a people of God, do not get caught by surprise by all these events. Um, today, I have this book here. It's called Rome's Challenge. We've ordered it recently um, in about 30 of them. It's a very good witnessing tool if you didn't know about this little booklet. Um, it's basically a Catholic church. Um, they wrote a series of articles back in the uh, 1890s regarding Sabbath and Sunday, and who changed it. It's actually them saying it. They actually say, it's we that changed it. And if you want to follow the Bible and Bible only, you better become Seventh-day Adventist. It's the Catholic Church saying this. So we have this booklet um, that contains those articles, and it's a good witnessing tool to those who are contemplating on Sabbath issues. So I just want to introduce to you guys to this book. So this is free to take if you want to give out to people. Um, you can take it and give it to people. And if we run out, we're going to order some more, and that'll be an exciting thing, won't it? Now, before I begin, um, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so privileged to be able to come and worship you on your holy day. With um, religious freedom, Father, we often don't realize that the freedom we enjoy was come about with great sacrifice of many blood. But Father, we also know that the time is coming that we will not be able to worship you like this. Father, we know that the time is coming when we require true living faith. And it's this morning as we open your word and study about faith of your people, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our minds and enlighten us, and ultimately transform us, Lord. Father, please be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's sermon is titled, Choice of Faith. Um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, because Hebrews chapter 11 is known as what? It's the chapter of faith, right? It's the chapter of faith. Now, what if... If you could have everything in this world that you wanted, everything that you want in your life. You know, in my first life, I desired to have like a nice big house, very comfortable, a few minutes down to the beach, um, no mortgage, secure, well-paying job, many nice cars for different occasions, not just one car, but um, I was thinking about like five different cars for many different occasions. I was so into cars. And cleaners come and clean your house, garden come and do your gardening, um, and you don't have to worry about anything in your life, and your job is just for entertainment because you love that job. <laughs> what if you could have that life? That was my wish in my first life, um, which I never got to have, but uh, I actually enjoy my second life more, uh, which has nothing to do with any of those things. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, 
What if you could have the life of your dreams? I don't know what you have in your mind. Maybe becoming president of the United States. I don't know who would want that, but um, somebody might, right? What if becoming a prime minister in New Zealand? Or, I don't know, if you like being a king or queen, um, queen of England or king of England. What if you could become that? But God is not there, and God is not your li- in your life. Or on the other hand, what if you have this other life where you have to suffer for Christ's sake? You have to have, you're going to have difficulties financially, uncomfortable living arrangements, uh, no house of your own, um, living just day to day on minimum wage, and you have to go around knocking on doors and Um, you get mocked and you get humiliated by people. What if you have those two choices? Which one would you choose? Obviously, as Christians, we would say, you know, as Christians, we should choose the latter instead of the former, right? But um, how many people would actually choose that life if they actually had that choice? If they actually had the former life the one that you could, you have everything that you dream of. How many people would actually choose that life? Well, today I'm going to talk about a man who did exactly that. Actually, more than that, because um, he could have been the best king ever of then most powerful nation. And he could have been recorded in history as the best poet, best general, best philosopher, best legislator. And he could have had best tomb in history of this world. I don't know. To some people, that's very important. Uh, you know, if you remember Absalom, he, even before he died, I mean, well before, in his young age, he made his tomb for himself. So obviously, to some people, that's very important. But he, this person decided to forsake it all. And you know who this guy is, right? You know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about Moses. I probably meditate upon his life the most, apart from Christ's life, especially when I'm tempted to look back on my journey in any negative way. Um, Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 27. It talks about Moses' experience in this way. By faith, Moses, when he was come, come to ears, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Remember the word refused. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, if you would summarize this passage in one word, it would be faith. It would be faith. This word faith is so often misunderstood in Christianity. You know, if you go to different churches, many people have different ideas about faith. Um, Christians would say, by grace, by faith, we are saved, and... um, and then we will have everlasting life. But in saying it, though, often the notion that people have about faith is an intellectual agreement to some intellectual knowledge. Many, even Seventh-day Adventism, people think, you know, intellectually agreeing to 28 fundamentals and coming to church on right day, that they're in a saving relationship. Actually, the ancient Jews thought quite similarly, too. They thought, that a knowledge of the law would in itself assure the man eternal life. But what does it say in Hebrews chapter 11? All these heroes of faith, what does the Bible say that the faith is? Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Offering. Is that a noun or a verb? It's a verb, right? It's an action word. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, for he pleased God. By faith, Enoch pleased God, right? 
It wasn't just a mental agreement. He actually lived a life that was pleasing to God. By faith, verse 7, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his family, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Imagine being Noah in a world that has never, ever seen rain. And you don't even need a boat to go anywhere in this world. But here's this man building an ark with everything he has, and he puts everything in there. And imagine being him, and everyone's looking at him. What's this old man doing with his money and everything he has? Yeah? And for 120 years, Noah hammering nails <laughs> and building this ark. Can you imagine that? What if you had to wait for Jesus' second coming for 120 years? That would be something, right? That would be something. Being mocked and shamed by people because you're always saying, Jesus is coming soon, right? But by faith, all these people obeyed God, though they could not see the promise of God fulfilled immediately in their life. In other words, faith is not just an intellectual agreement, but it has a real, tangible substance. It, it is actual substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the Bible says in verse 1. The life of faith in the believer's life is the evidence of the believer seeing God who is invisible through the eyes of faith. And the Bible says, by faith, what did he do? Please, talk to me. Verse 24, by faith, Moses. Louder, please, I can't hear you. <laughs> refused, thank you. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And in this verse, in this single sentence, is condensed so much information. What did it mean to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter? Have you ever thought about that? This Pharaoh's daughter, historians say, the archaeologists say, um, is likely the Queen Hatshepsut. And she was the most powerful queen in Egyptian history. Um, my memory is a bit vague, but I think she probably was the only queen pharaoh <laughs> that ruled. Um, and she co-ruled with um, this infant um, pharaoh named Tutmosis III. We'll talk about him later on. But um, he was the most powerful pharaoh in Egyptian history, by the way. So if Moses indeed was Queen Hatshepsut's stepson, what does that tell you? It was He could have been made the pharaoh himself as well. That's something, right? He could have been the next pharaoh. Because he, Queen Hatshepsut was a very powerful ruler. She ruled with this infant king for 22 years. Just remember that. You know, in 22 years, a person grows up. And even when this Tutmosis III was grown up, she was still in co-regency. So you, you can sort of get the idea how powerful Queen Hatshepsut was. And the Bible says Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in deeds and words. So he had the whole world before him if we wanted to have it, right? A life of honor, fame, riches, royalty, comfort, anything our imagination can desire. You know, Moses didn't just have everything that a normal person could have if they really tried hard and if they won a lotto. <laughs> he actually had everything that a normal person could not have even if they wanted it. But the Bible says he rather chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. What made Moses do this? This is what the Bible says is faith. This wasn't easy. But as we know, his birth mother did an excellent job with Moses, right? Because he had, she had to let him go and live in the palace after certain years of looking after him. So I just want to encourage our mothers in, the, in this congregation because if you could raise your child to be like Moses, 
But I'm going to say, you're doing a better job than any missionary that are out in the foreign lands. Because just imagine, if your children can be like Moses, then how much good that they can do for God when they grow up, right? And Moses, when he grew up, he could have just argued, you know, if I become the next Pharaoh, I could release the Israelites by my authority and by my might, right? He could have said that. I just need to stay put and wait and become the next Pharaoh. And you know what? I could lead the Egyptian army before the Israelites and go up to Canaan and destroy the Canaanites. And then I could be king in both countries, you know, king of the Israelites and king of Egyptians. He could have, said, he could have argued that way. How wonderful would that have been? But if we wanted to do that, he had to make a compromise. Because to be a pharaoh in Egypt meant that he had to become the priest of sun god. So friends, I want to suggest to, suggest to you this morning that faith begins by refusing the world, refusing to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter the son of this world, refusing the world because it is not God's way. You know, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, what does he need to do? Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's not acceptable in God's way. If it's not according to God's word, you reject it. You deny it. That's what Jesus says. True faith begins by Refusing the world. Now, when I went to Canada, I met my friend from primary school. I haven't met him for ages. And I don't even remember him, actually. I didn't even remember him. But he remembered me after, like, I don't know, um, 25 years. And I've totally forgotten about him. I don't, I don't even remember his face. I actually went home and looked at the photo albums, and I couldn't even recognize who this guy was. But here, I went to my um, cousin's place in Canada, and this guy recognized me. And he remembered my name, because my name is rather unique in Korean. So yeah, he remembered my name. And he asked me if I was that guy, and I said yes. And, and we were just talking about how we lived our life. And I told him my journey, um, how my journey started with um, that uh, I had to reject worshiping my ancestors before my ancestors, uh, not my ancestors, but someone else's ancestors' grave, I was asked to do that, to keep the peace in the family. And I told him my journey, that it started with refusing the comfort and avoiding all the shame and mocking in my life. And then he shared with me his story too, that he had this faith journey, that he was starting to become a pilot. And he finished his schooling, and he did his hours, and he was almost at the brink of becoming a commercial jet pilot. But then he realized if he was hired as a pilot, then he won't be able to keep seven. And that was a very tough decision for him. And he said in the end, you know, I'm going to do what is right in God's sight. And he gave, that, gave up that career completely. And when I heard that story, you know, it struck a chord with me, and, and I thought to myself, that is faith. That is faith. Because if you become an airline a pilot, probably not right now, but you could make pretty good money, and you could be very well respected in society, and yeah, all these things that come with it. But my friend decided God's way, or I'm not going to do it. So true faith begins by refusing what is not right in the sight of God. Refusing anything that will get in the way of accomplishing God's purpose in our life. Yet other people experience more severe experience when they start their journey. When I went to China, you know, we often read about these stories and in, the, um, in one of these mission readings. You know, we often read about this story. And the lady who invited me to China to spend some time there and speak to the youth, um, I later got to hear her story. Um, when she became a Christian, the culture in China will not allow 
different religion in the household. And she had to make a difficult decision. When she decided to get baptized and become a member of Seventh-day Adventist Church, her husband and his family decided, okay, we can't have you in our household. I'm going to have to divorce you and you're going to have to go. So, she had a hard decision to make. And she had to leave that house without nothing in her hands. As she said goodbye to her seven-year-old son, she pledged her faithfulness to God. And even today, she lives a very faithful life. She has a very good relationship with her son, by the way. But this lady's faith is real. When I went and spoke with her, she's always faith, I mean, always cheerful. She, you won't actually see her discouraged. She's a woman of faith. And God provides all her needs as she works for God. She goes from province to province to preach the gospel and let people know that Jesus is coming soon. By faith, this lady chose to suffer the consequence of choosing Jesus rather than to enjoy the life of sin for a season on earth. You know, faith is not just believing that Jesus died in our place and took my sins, and my sins are now forgiven. It is that, but it's more than that. True faith chooses rather to suffer with God. The Bible doesn't say that Christian walk is without hard choices. The Bible doesn't say that there won't be any pain in our journey. But when you put everything on the altar of God, but choose God's way, you know, there's something strange that happens in our hearts. You know, even though your life might go into this tumultuous situation with um, your families hating you and things like that, but there's strange peace that this world does not understand. And that's why we choose faith. Moses, because he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and you all know what he had to go through, right? As we well know, he spent 40 years in wilderness living in tents, right? Looking after the sheep. A prince to a stranger in a foreign land. And this I must preach about later on, by the way, because it applies to us in these last days. But I must say that Moses is a fool in the eyes of men today. I mean, why would you give up a throne to be part of a people who are slaves, right? But he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. As you well know, there are indeed pleasures of, pleasures of sin, right? But it's for a season. You know, whatever you do in this world, you know, it might give you pleasure for a short time. I don't know if you are into binge watching or anything like that. I was when I was in the world. You know, I would go through a list of, you know, these um, sitcoms that people say that are great. And I would just sit there and watch like 20 hours straight. It's terrible that I used to do that. Because it's, it gives you this dopamine hit in your brain and it's, it's very pleasurable. But you know what happens afterwards though, right? You get this crash that your dopamine levels come down like crazy and you go into this deep blue afterwards. And that's what it is like with the pleasures of sin in this world. They might be fun for a season, but it comes with a vengeance. But just think about it though, to Canaan from Egypt, how long do you think it actually took? You know, Moses could have just walked there in seven days. Seven days, that's right. But he had to go on, a, on this journey of 40 years in the wilderness with the people of God. How many people would be willing to do that? You could go somewhere in seven days, but <laughs> just to be with these people, you're spending 40 years in wilderness living in tents. You know? That's something that Moses had to go through. And do you think these people were very nice people? You know, they criticized Moses all along the way. They tried to stone him multiple times. They complained and blamed Moses for everything that went wrong in their journey. Right? 
Why did you bring us out of Egypt? We were perfectly happy there with all the food of Egypt, you know. We would rather have died there. Right? And Moses had to hear this for 40 years. But the Bible says he actually esteemed the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. To Moses, God's name, God's honor and glory was more important than himself. To Moses, God was real. He felt great privilege to be used by God in any capacity. It was more than anything in this world. Why? Because of faith. Because he saw God, though he's invisible, he saw him with the eye of faith. There's this hymn, right? I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. The lyrics of this, this hymn was written by Rhea F. Miller in 1922 as a poem. But the tune came about um, by a composer, um, Christian singer and composer, George Bivalichier. I don't know if you know this story. Um, George's mother wanted to um, give her, her son a change in life's direction. So one day she decides... I'm going to write this poem on a paper. And I'm going to put it, put it on his piano so he can find it and read it. And lo and behold, George found this little poem on piano and he started reading it. And then a tune came to his mind and he started playing that tune that seems to, seemed to fit this poem. And this poem was so powerful that it actually completely changed his life. Later, he was presented a popular music career with NBC. That's a broadcast network in um, America. But instead, he chose to work with the evangelist Billy Graham. And he sang this hymn all around the world. I'd rather have Jesus. So when opportunities arise in life to make a great gain, but it's not in line with the will of God, will we say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. When we say, I'd rather be his than riches untold, like my Auntie Sue in China, if your family and friends forsake you, will you still say, I'd rather have Jesus than house or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands. When everything you own is taken off you, will you still say, I'd rather have Jesus? And anything this world affords today. When you are fired for what you believe in, will you still say, I'd rather have Jesus? And that's a challenge that we're going to be have to face very soon in this world. Friends, this faith, faith is not a mere intellectual agreement. It's a choice. It's a choice to rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's an esteeming reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For God sees all, and he'll reward us in the end, for sure. In Hebrews chapter 11, let's go to verse 39, is actually making an appeal to us living in the end times. It reads, and these all, having obtained the good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. In other words, all these people have not yet received what they believe to receive from God. They cannot receive it unless we do our part in these last days. That's what the Bible is saying. It's like a relay race, if you like. At every relay race, you know, you have people taking the baton and they're running. And then what they do? What do they do? They have to pass it on to the next runner. And then they have to pass it on to the next runner. 
And even though previous runners do their job and stay ahead of all the other, other competitors, what happened? It all comes down to the last runner, right? If the last runners mess up, then the whole race is lost. And here we are at the end of Earth history, the most perverse and wicked generation in human history. And the Bible is asking us, will you and I run this race of faith that Abel ran, that Enoch ran, that Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob ran, this race that Moses ran, the reformers, Adventist pioneers, the person whom he sacrificed his life to give you the truth ran. That's what the Bible is asking you and I this morning. Will you and I make that choice every day to reject and refuse anything that is not God's will and rather suffer with Christ in performing God's will? You know, it's quite interesting when you are on a journey with God. God opens up different doors and you get to experience many different things. And recently I've I've started working as a Bible worker and I don't know what to do because I've never done it before and I don't know about you, but I find that God seems to want to throw you in the deep end and you think you are not able to swim, but lo and behold, you find out that God has already changed you for it. It's quite interesting, but um, as I was going around and um, knocking on doors, and some doors you get really positive response and you knock it down and say, I'm going to go back to that person. But there's doors that really slam on you. Um, I'd rather have it slammed, but um, there was what, this one lady, you know, I gave her a flyer, and then she crumpled it right in my face, like that, and I was like, I was thinking, hey, I don't like this, you know, why would I want to do this, you know, I could always go back to my old job, this is a minimum paying job, I don't have to do this, and then a thought came to me, you know, if Jesus came down to this earth and walked this planet, he didn't have to do it, but he did it because he wanted to save us. And then a thought came to me, you know, I shouldn't be complaining about this because I'm partaking in the suffering that Jesus is suffering, that Jesus has suffered for us. And that's the challenge we have, isn't it? Because every time God asks us to do something, it's going against our human nature, our sinful nature. We don't want to do it. Because there's shame and humiliation attached to it. But the Bible says the true faith esteems the reproach of Christ more than the treasure of this world. Let's go to chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with the patience of the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint, in your minds, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know, modern Christianity, I don't know if you've noticed, modern Christianity have ceased to strive against sin. Vast majority, even in Adventism, say we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. I don't know if you heard about that one. A lot of theologians in our circle say, We'll still be sinning until Jesus comes. But considering how much the Bible talks about overcoming sin, it is a great wonder. I, I just don't understand why we don't hear more about overcoming sin. And the question is, have we also ceased to strive against sin? Is there anything in our life that is not according to the Word of God that we well know of, but we just come to live with it. I don't know about you, but um, lately I've been searching my heart and um, I've realized that there are many things that I still need to change in my life. But often we say, you know, Holy Spirit, please come tomorrow because 
maybe tomorrow I'll be more receptible to listen to you. I don't really have the time to unpack Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, but I want to say this one thing. Christian walk is a constant denial excuse me, of self and the world. And resisting of sin, don't ever let anyone tell you that it is inevitable that we sin. Apostle John said, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it does not say that we must all continue to sin. Instead it says, He is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of of his glory with exceeding joy. And it all begins by refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the son of this world, letting go of worldliness in us, giving up what is known as sin in our life. When we truly behold Jesus, there won't be anything that we will not be able to give up. You know, in the Egyptian museum in Cairo, apparently houses the mummy of Thutmose III, the pharaoh who co-ruled with um, Moses' stepmother. And his mummy is in there. Um, Thutmose III is actually called uh, Thutmose the Great. Um, and he is most likely to be the pharaoh of Exodus, the, um, some of the archaeologists say. And this pharaoh... Um, whom Moses' mother co-ruled with, um, she could have easily removed him if she wanted to uh, when she was in the peak of her power. And as you know, if Moses did not make that choice to refuse to be the, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, if he had not chose to leave behind everything he had in his position, his position, his influence, and his status, he actually could have been known as Moses the great, you know? He actually could have been known as the greatest pharaoh, greatest historian, poet, philosopher, general of armies, legislator in human history because Moses was a very capable man. But he would, rather, he would be the one lying in the place of Tut Moses III. But praise God, by God's grace, he made the right choice. The choice of faith. With the whole world before him, he had the moral strength to refuse the flattering prospect of wealth and greatness and fame. By faith, he saw high honors that will be bestowed on the saints of the Most High in the kingdom untainted by sin. Moses is not in a tomb somewhere on this earth. You know, if you look at those mummies, they really are works of art, you know, how they are preserved so intricately after thousands of years. But at the end of the day, they're still dead, right? They're still dead. But Moses is not in a tomb somewhere on this planet. He is up in heaven. And he had the privilege of coming down to the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ was going through the most darkest and difficult time on earth, on his mission. And friends, it is this faith that Moses demonstrated and all the other heroes of faith demonstrated. It is that faith that we need to have in these last days. And it is that choice of faith that we need to make daily in our lives. I once heard this sermon by this um, pastor who rebaptized me. I learned everything about Adventism through his sermons. When he was studying at the seminary um, that I am studying at at the moment, um, he met this pastor from a small African nation. Um, his name was Adabit. And this pastor was very special because he was from a royal tribe, um, a royal family in a tribe. And when he was three, his mother, the queen at the time, accepted Christianity. And as a result, she was exiled. And he couldn't see her for 
many, many years until he grew up to be an adult. But years later, when he was an adult, his mother decides that she will sneak into the palace at night and try to get in contact with her son. And one evening, she found him, and she approached him, and she told him who she, who she was. And then she started talking about the Bible and the Savior whom she found that she left everything behind her for. And she went there many, many nights and spent time with her son. And one day, the Holy Spirit touched his heart and he decides to give his life to God. And one evening, he decided to flee with her mom. And he did. And the first night he spent outside that palace on the dirt floor, he was looking through the hole in the roof. He could see the stars. And then he started crying. You know, he must have felt that Jesus was very near to him because he could see the glimpse of what Jesus left behind to come and save us. And I tell you, this is faith. Esteeming the riches, reproaches of Christ greater, than, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And it all begins by refusing to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, the son of this world, because we are sons and daughters of God. And the Bible says, without this faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This morning, I want to ask a question. Do we, as a people of God in Orewa, want to have this faith in our life today? Do we want to have this faith in our life that is going to stand the test of time, above everything that is in our life, above everything, even our family. Do we want to have this faith? You know, we are living in such a time that true faith is going to be needed. And such faith only comes from knowing God so intimately, to the point that we love him more than anything in this world. Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on earth? Will he find faith in you and I this morning? And it's my prayer that he will indeed find faith in you and me when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the wonderful history that you have preserved for us living in the last days. Father, it is such an encouragement to have all these records for us to read and to meditate upon. Father, this morning we want to make that decision to follow you all the way. Father, we want to serve you with all our hearts. Father, we'd rather have Jesus than anything in this world, Lord. Fathers, Please seal our hearts this morning that we may be your witnesses in these last days. Father, we pray that you will use us and use this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.